It's a great pleasure for me to uh, be asked to, to, um, to, to chair this panel uh, because I'm with Natanya Jantz, the publisher at Sort Of. So we've, got, uh, we've published 23 Moomin titles over the last 20 years. Uh, and um, I'm also uh, Andrew's publisher uh, in England of uh, his most recent book on time and water. Um, I actually gave this last year to um, Rolly uh, Krautstrom and, and Sophia when they came to Iceland to look at uh, doing uh, uh, this tour of a festival. And um, I think Rolly in particular was so inspired by this book that um, his enthusiasm was, was one of the reasons why we're having this um, Torve Festival uh, here in, in Reykjavik this year. Um, I also think it's a wonderful pairing to have Andri and Torve. Um, Andri, I'm sure, needs very little introduction to this audience here in, in, in Iceland, but for those watching um, online, um, streaming or later, uh, he is, like Torve, the author of both children's books and books for adults. Um, his children's book, uh, his first children's book, The Blue Planet, which we'll talk about um, uh, later in more detail, is an eco-fable about nature and climate change uh, that's been translated into 20, more than 20 languages? 40, I think. 40 languages. Uh, um, he's made films, he's written a sci-fi novel, uh, he's created a manifesto for his country, Dreamland. Um, but maybe the nicest link is, is actually about life rather than books. Um, Torvi, as we know, spent uh, almost every summer of her adult life um, on an island in the Finnish archipelago, or two islands, in fact. Uh, the, the latter one, uh, Klovarun, uh, where she and her partner, um, Tuti, would sleep most nights, not in the cabin that they'd built, but in a, in a tent um, perched on a, on a rock um, and where she liked nothing better than listening to and actually kind of being part of the storms that washed over uh, this tiny island. Um, Andrew is, I think, I think, equally rooted in nature. Um, he's most famous uh, globally for his plaque, The Letter to the Future, uh, which marks Iceland's first extinct glacier and urges us, as we know how to prevent the destruction of all glaciers um, and the continuation of climate change, uh, it urges us to act now to do something. Um, and he was telling me last night that he is also um, one of the first uh, public uh, acts uh, he, he, he did was to persuade uh, the city of Reykjavik to switch off all its streetlights for half an hour one night so that everyone could see the stars um, and maybe even the northern lights and while listening to uh, an astronomer talking on the radio. Uh, that seems a very kind of Torve Moomin uh, idea, um, the essence of Moomin spirit. Um, Andrew, do you want to say something about, about those kind of activities that you've uh. Well, yes, uh, so it's a, it's a great honor to be here on stage in, in uh, memorizing, uh, remembering the legacy of Tove. And uh, I think on behalf of the storytellers of Iceland, we are very grateful to her uh, memory. So, yes, so I have done some acts like this that are not direct literature. Uh, so turning off the night the lights of Reykjavik, uh, the thought was, of course, we are raising the first generation of human children since the evolution of man, the first generation of children that do not have access to the night sky. So you could imagine, you know, a, a, a generation without colors or, or without music. Uh, the sky, which is kind of the root of navigation, religion, science, math, uh, basically everything in human culture. What does it mean to be raised without access to this infinity? So while we have more information about space through science, we have less connection to space as humans. So, uh, so this very simple act was also an experiment of, can we 
control our machines. You know, can we decide to do something? And then can we decide to turn it off? And then this act here, which is the letter to the future, which was a peculiar kind of a, a task that I got to make an obituary for a glacier. And, and this was something that I had to scratch my head over a, a long summer, like, uh, because a, a glacier used to be a symbol of eternity. And in Kurt Vonnegut, uh, in Slotros 5, the characters are discussing uh, he's saying, he, the character says, I'm writing an anti-war book. And somebody says uh, cynically, aha, why don't you write an anti-glacier book? Uh, because uh, just like there will always be wars, there will always be, uh, just like there will always be glaciers, yeah. there will always be wars. But guess what? There will not always be glaciers. On the positive side, maybe then there will not always be wars. But... Uh, but, but just an example of a writer in the 60s or 50s thought a glacier was a symbol of eternity, but suddenly we're on the other side of the paradigm where it's not. Mm. So um, that's the letter to the future. And it's all about stories, isn't it? That's, that's the root of all Torve's work, and it's the root of all your work, whether it's in, uh, in your work for adults or, 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 or in your children's books. It's it's the story which captures people's imagination and uh, and the diff I think it's fair to say that climate change is, is the, the heart of what you want to write about and what you want to, to tell stories about, but the, the way to get people's attention has to be through a story. Yes, I met a climate scientist in Potsdam and he asked me, why don't you write about climate change? And I said, I don't feel I have authority. I'm not a scientist. I don't have the data. My, my father's a doctor. He hates it when uh, uh, normal people are giving medical advice, uh, eat more avocado or something. Uh, but he said, I'm not a storyteller, this, this mm -hmm. scientist. And he said, uh, uh, people don't understand data. They understand stories. So, uh, so I started to think, what kind of stories can you tell that uh, make climate change relatable and what stories connect to us. And, uh, and if we look at Tove, she was writing stories within very turbulent times. And she's a very good example of, of how do you react to basically apocalypse. She's even thinking mm -hmm. of, like we're seeing now a mega trend of people not wanting to have children uh, because of the future. Uh, she was dealing with that and maybe many of her generation why should you have children just to be thrown into some, some, some chaos or, or, or the war machine in that case, or the climate struggle in our case? And uh, so, uh, like, you could look at her books like The, the Comet and, uh, and The Great Floods and, like, uh, how does an artist take on a huge issue like this? Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the kind of core books in, in terms of Torve reacting to or, or, or drawing upon natural and environmental disasters uh, uh, and telling stories about it are her, her very first two books, The, the, the Great Flood, um, which came out of her, which was, well, which was actually written towards the end of the war and it was a time of uh, obviously deep uh, flux in the in the country. Finland had had two wars, uh, and she wanted to write. Uh, she wanted to write, as she described it at the time, a fairy story. But actually, when you look at the book, it's it's rooted in images of of refugees and and, and disasters and the comet, even more so when you've got some. Um, You've got the whole cast of characters in Comet who are fleeing, um, fleeing this, what they think might be the end of the world. Um, this illustration here is quite interesting. This, this is, um, uh, I think it's easy to think that the Moomins uh, and Torvis' creation of the Moomins came out of, of nothing, but actually she, throughout the war and, and through until the 1950s, she was drawing these cartoons for the Finnish magazine Garm. And uh, often these feel a bit impenetrable 
if you're not Finnish and you don't know your Finnish history, but this is one uh, a cartoon which I think just says Happy New Year, and 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 here's a you know a, really a, a line of refugees or a line of people in uh, people displaced by the war or without uh, without anything to eat, queuing up for what doesn't look like a very uh, uh, auspicious bit of uh, fishing. Um, it actually feels to me very much uh, aligned with the movements. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's sort of, it's people, but it could be a movement illustration almost. Um, so I think these illustrations that she did, these cartoons for Gram, actually led very naturally into those first two books, The, the Great Flood and, and Comet. Um, this is, the, these are illustrations from uh, the Great Flood, which was originally called in, 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 in Finnish, the, 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 little, uh, the Little Trolls. And, um, uh, and this is sort of, well, this is, this is apocalypse, isn't it, uh, that, that we're seeing here. Um, the world has been flooded. Uh, the the, uh, the Moomin family has lost its it's it's quite a simple and, and in a way compared to the later books quite a crude story. But um, uh, Moomin and his mother have lost Moomin Papa, who's sort of been tricked into going off with the Hattie Fatness, and it's never quite clear whether he was off on an adventure or whether he'd been kind of kidnapped. Um, uh, but it's really, I think to me, it's, it's about refugees, it's about being reunited with family, uh, and, which is a, a big theme in many of the books, isn't it? And I think uh, also she's a very great example of, because of course she's living within the catastrophe, and, and if you look at images from Europe from that time, it is basically, it is some kind of an apocalypse that is happening there and for many people. And, and what I think you can learn from it is her philosophy point of view that even within the darkest moments, the, like, the most grave situations, she finds uh, so much humanity and hope and, uh, and philosophy. And I, I think it's also astonishing that you don't see hate and anger in her works from that time. Mm -hmm. That is, it would be so obvious to make a good and evil metaphor, mm -hmm. good versus evil, uh, or uh, or some kind of a Tolkien invasion of orcs, uh, which uh, where the orcs are maybe his metaphor for the enemy, and they're basically non-human, but everybody in her work is so human, or yeah, even though they're not human. Even though they're not human. <laughs> so, they're more so human for not being they're human. So human, or they're almost like, uh, archetypes of humans, that yeah. is, uh, and, the, and even the most traumatized humans in, in her work are some kind of archetypes. So, so, and also the people and the, within the events, they're kind of, uh, they don't really have any control over it, they only have control over their own attitude against what is happening. So like they were referring to this evening was like, a, yeah, the, there's a dance, and, and how can you dance when the, the comet is coming? Well, it, it, it's not coming until in two days. So until the comet comes, then you could, you, you should dance. Yeah. Uh, and there is some kind of playfulness and joy, and I think uh, per personally, as an artist, I think her legacy is extremely important in the way of, uh, of, of, children's culture or this culture of fantasy, children's literature, with this double layer. So you both talk to children, but you also talk to the grown-up reading for the child or the child within every single grown-up as being ex-children. Uh, I was a child for 12 years, so I almost have a PhD in being a child. Uh, <laughs> so so, uh, so that that is within us and needs to be fed and spoken to. And it was quite a radical um, way of, uh, quite a radical path in children's literature, I think, at the time, to, to have this as a backdrop to, to a story. Um, I remember reading that, that in 
I think the, the, the first two books completely flopped in Denmark, for example, which had rather sort of trite stories at the time, and they just, it was too serious for children's literature. But um, I don't think Torvi ever made a, a sort of obvious distinction between writing for children and writing for adults. She just, she told stories, and um, you could say that, you know, a book like The Summer Book, for example, which we might talk about a bit more later, is impossible to say whether that's a children's book or an adult's book. It's, a, it's just a great. I, I think personally for me, like when you look at, when you're starting to write and you look at artists as role models, or uh, uh, I was never looking at people that maybe had just one genre and, and stuck to that, which would be like Tolkien or, or, or somebody like that. But, uh, but like Tove, which showed this huge variety in, in her talent and, and her, how she would dare to step out of something that was showing success and, and showing them a completely different side of herself. So, so, so like Tove, she has this fantastic and then this super simplicity of, of like the, uh, the summer book mm -hmm. uh, and sincere, uh, realistic relationship. You also see it with Orwell. He would have 1984 and he would have Animal Farm, but he would also have uh, Coming Up for Air, which is also like this realistic, sincere, personal tone. Uh, you, you will also see it with Vonnegut, uh, and he would have like fantasy and, and also some children's references, but then he would also have this personal tone. And I think, uh, at least personally for me, to show this kind of, uh, that, that they could switch from extreme fantasy, playfulness, silliness, madness, to, to be, be just on an island with a child yeah. and, and, and show some kind of core of humanity also there. But here, actually, the, with these comic covers, the, 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 it's a, both of them, in their own ways, are an example of, of catastrophe and playfulness. I mean, you've, 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 you've got the, 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 the Moomins fleeing uh, uh, on the classic uh, English cover, but the, 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 the one on our right, you know, it's, it's a sort of bleak, apocalyptic scene where the ocean has disappeared. Uh, but actually, they're kind of having fun on stilts. They're at the working same on time. stilts, so there is that, and, uh, and the ocean has that, vanished. Yeah, that great playfulness. I mean, this, the, that, that, that wonderful picture at the top where, where, where they're just enjoying walking across this ocean bed. Um, I, I agree with the people that we're talking today that I felt lots of this very gloomy when I was a child. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was very bleak, uh, especially these black and white pictures. And it was like, uh, I, I just came from America when I was nine, and this was. You wanted full color, full American well, it was color. It was just, uh, color. it was just very different culturally. So it, it took me. Uh, it wasn't until in my adult years and when I had children myself that I started to. Yes. Really appreciate this. I brought this the, the, this picture up here actually because it just does seem. It's, it's really a depiction of, of refugees, isn't it? And, and so, uh, you know, a kind of a timely thing for us to be looking at now because the, the two crises, and they are, of course, intimately connected, are climate change and the refugee crisis. Yes, um, and, and now we have the, the climate crisis. And, uh, and I was actually thinking of uh, kind of how her books fit the climate crisis or, or like... Yeah. Because of course we have the great flood and uh, and many of it, uh, but she wasn't, in a way, you also feel that uh, a crisis in her book because she's so philosophical that uh, some of it could even even be just like an emotional thing or an emotional metaphor. But what we're having, but in this case, like the the. The, uh, the humanity of, of everybody's welcome. And I think it's astonishing to read a book from that time, how there is, uh, there's almost no evil, I feel. Mm -hmm. Like there, is, there are some tricksters, there are some gloominess, there are some figures that are very dark, but, but uh, the existence of pure evil, and I think, I think that is the big light that you can feel in her, her work, is even in, in all of this, 
and it would be so obvious in your imagination too. And like in modern dystopias, where the comet was coming, it's so obvious to go into this survival yeah. uh, uh, war or, uh, or tribalism or something. But there you have like the, this huge equality of, of, of everybody's accepted, everybody's welcome, everybody's kind of on the same, on the same ship. That, that's really one of the great themes, isn't it? The welcoming, uh, yeah. the, the welcoming of refugees, the welcoming of lost people. Uh, everybody is welcome in the sort of, in, in, in the Moomin, Moomin Mama uh, universe, and it's about providing a welcome. Uh, the Invisible Child, later that story in, the, in Tales from Moomin Valley is another perfect example of, you know, this child who, who has somehow been, been sort of destroyed by her previous foster home and she comes into the Moomin household and gradually, uh, you know, literally she becomes, she just gradually puts, becomes herself again uh, and, and becomes visible and, uh, and part of it. And th there's also a sort of more, the, the other book, of course, which has a catastrophe as it, at its heart is, is, is Midsummer Madness, but it's a much lighter, uh, it's a later book, it's, uh, you know, it's written eight or ten years after the war. Um, and it's a comedy, really, uh, and it's based around... It also has Torrey's great love of theatre at the heart of it. Um, what, one of my favourite bit, bits in that is, is when little my... Uh, I mean, I think the, the, it shows just how the whole tone is different. Um, there's a description of the catastrophe and the crashing, screeching and the heavy waves against the shutters. Is it the end of the world, asked little Mai, curiously. Um, at the very least, said the Mimble's daughter, try to be good if you've time, for we shall probably all be soon entering heaven. Heaven, little Mai repeated. Must we enter heaven? And how does one get out of it again? <laughs> Which I think is just one of my favorite passages of, of Torbe's. So, like, what we're faced with today as, as humanity is, is kind of a paradigm shift because... Uh, the leaders of the world, they have never met to discuss the weather. That is how they are discussing it now. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, that is, that is, they, Genghis Khan, Julius Caesar, Ramses II, they did not understand that they were melting glaciers. Uh, Moses, he split the Red Sea, and it's remembered still today. Uh, but that was just for a day or two, and it's just a small part of the Red Sea. Uh, and, and, and that's quite small uh, as an achievement compared to raising the global sea levels by one meter, yeah. which they are meeting to discuss now. So, so slowly we start to see that we are living some kind of mythological times where, uh, where the leaders of the world are kind of you know, and, and this fact that they're discussing this now, and it's like they don't really understand it because they're still stuck in their political ideologies of the 20th century that were created before they under, this was understood. And sometimes people don't actually understand the times they are living in, even if they pretend they understand them, mm. if you understand. Uh, uh, so, 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 so I think in, if we look, if we zoom out like 400 years and people look back and then they will see this moment, you know, around 1990, 2000, 2010, where this was kind of a fact that was discussed and, and, and we will see the, the power these leaders of the world had in terms of decisions. So, so even a writer today is in this crazy position, like, why did I write this book uh, that you published? Uh, on Time and Water. On Time and Water, for I was example. just gonna say that the whole concept, uh, one of the st strongest, most extraordinary things about Andrew's book on Time and Water is, is how you talk about just the concept of time uh, changes completely from, from a kind of geological time to a... Uh, I mean, you, you're talking about thousands of years for changes to happen, and then suddenly it's tens of years, it's within a generation, within yes. a family. so it's all acting within the lifetime of a single human being. So, so you could say, 
Why did you write the book? Yes, because I want to influence policy that changes uh, where we're heading. So you could say, I'm, I'm, why are you writing a book? I'm, 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 I'm trying to prevent the oceans from rising. So you're suddenly in this kind of magical situation, artists that are writing about this issue. We're trying to prevent the flood with words, yeah. which is a very strange situation uh, because I don't think a hundred years ago anybody could have said, I'm, I'm writing a book because I want to preserve glaciers. Uh, so it's, it's also a new territory within the position of a writer or a politician or, or a human that is suddenly huge forces that are big as comets or, or big as, as, as a, a flood are within our culture. So words uh, that could be like a word of law can influence the level of the oceans. So, so that's, that is because in the old times people believed in the magical power of words. But this is suddenly coming as a very concrete fact yeah. that the, the world leaders, they can write a law or a policy that will change the life of species, glaciers, oceans. But it seems like we don't understand it. So because now nature has left geological speed of change and is changing in a human speed. If we look at ocean acidification, ocean acidification, which is a very new word, it was created in the year 2004, and we expect the pH level of the world oceans to drop from 8.1 to 7.7. .7. And that's the biggest change in 50 million years. So that means a single human being born today becoming not as old as my grandmother, but just my father, will find a bigger change in the world oceans than not only all the ancestors of man, but 10 times the evolution of humanity. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a mythological event. Yeah. Andrew, you chose to, your, your very first book, you chose to write um, a children's book, The Blue Planet. And that's it, were you also writing this to prevent the flood and to, uh, to try and get across the idea that we, we can't mess with nature, we've got to. It's a parable, isn't it, really? And a, 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 yes, so the, the story of Blue Planet, that was uh, kind of written out of, I, I, you feel lots of things as a young person, you want to say lots of things, but then you live in this society, you're not a journalist, you're not a politician, and, and you want to say something important, but it's, it becomes so banal, it's, it's almost impossible to say, uh, let's all live in peace. You know, let's protect nature. It, it's, it's, mm. You want to say something, but it's, it's almost impossible. So suddenly I felt like I was living in a regime. The words that I wanted to say, they were just not taken seriously. And I was reading something about puppet theater in Eastern, Eastern Bloc, where lots of kind of, well, lots of the politics went into puppet theater because they were not allowed on the, on the above stage. And I was thinking that children's literature and, and this uh, fantasy, culture of fantasy and parables could actually be a powerful tool to say something important. So I, I, uh, I was just thinking of this situation where we, uh, like after the nuclear bomb, actually we, a single invention of a human could basically turn everything up, upside down but also the idea of a planet. That is, we're living on a planet and it's not so long since we started living on a planet. That is, in our mind. That is, uh, we were not all, it wasn't until Iceland was settled and we went to Greenland that humans were finally connected th throughout the whole planet. And, uh, and former generations did not know we were living on a planet. And most of the mythology and religion of humans was created before we knew we were living on a planet. Uh, so in like in Nordic mythology, uh, you're in this Midgard and the further you go from the center, the more vicious and brutal the beings become and, and the, the more worthy of, of killing them. But if you live on a planet, the further you go from home, the more likely it is you meet somebody that is just exactly like you. And, uh, and, and then you do something on this side of the planet and the horizon is super 
narrow that you have, and, and maybe you don't understand that you're having consequences on the other side of the planet. So I thought maybe we need mythology for a planet. Maybe we need to upgrade what it means to live on a planet. So I create this planet, and, uh, and this man comes to offer the children living on a planet happiness by, by putting a nail in the sun. And when he puts the nail in the sun, suddenly the other side is completely dark. And I find out that I have stumbled upon some kind of a metaphor for where we're living now. And we could say that the nail in the sun could, also, could both symbolize uh, the rich versus the poor, but it can also symbolize now versus the future. Because in a metaphorical way, we could say that our generation has put the nail in the sun to keep it shining on us, uh, neglecting uh, kind of uh, the children of the planet in 50 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it both works as a parable for the current planet, but it can also be on uh, how we are taking everything now without thinking of, 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 of what happens to them. And it's struck an enormous chord, that book, hasn't it? I mean, it's, uh, it seems to have grown in popularity as it's, as it's traveled around the world and been translated into... And it, hasn't it become a theatre uh, production as well in, in some places? Yes, so it's been produced as a play in, in Finland, mm -hmm. in, in Vasa. So maybe a small part of happiness in Finland comes. <laughs> no, no, but uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been produced in 10 stages at least worldwide, twice here in Iceland. One of the most interesting productions, I got a strange Facebook message like um, 10 years ago, and, uh, and a strange name was asking me for the play. And I thought first it was a scam because when you get... Facebook messages with strange names. It's, mm. it's, but, but they, and I was thinking, wow, are they doing research on me? But so I sent the play in English to, uh, to Iran. And then a year later, uh, I got a message and flooding, flooding with uh, photographs. And, and these were children in a city called Nairitz in Iran that had produced the play. Fantastic. And, and, uh, and, 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 and they were sent me a message as well. They were experiencing, I think, more than 50 degrees of summer heat and I think the 10th year of drought. And I felt like, okay, well, this is... Uh, this. They were living... Your they, were, they were living yeah. on the other side of the planet. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I missed somehow the, the cover of it, but... Uh, the, 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 um, the, these actually are later. Uh, Torbe... Um, I just wanted to touch on this because Torbe, Torbe wasn't sort of directly political through her life, but she did, um, she did take part in campaigns. The first one of these is, is I think, one of her last GARM uh, uh, illustrations, which, which stood out to me as having a sort of very environmental message with the, the birch trees being cut down on the islands and rubbish everywhere. Um, I was discussing this with Rowley. He said, actually, that's just a Finnish midsummer <laughs> uh, where everybody's drinking. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other two here, uh, th this was for, th these are beautiful, I think, these other two uh, Moomin ones, which were for a, a campaign, I think, in the 1960s for keep Sweden tidy, but I mean, they could, they could be used, and I think they have been reused, you know, for at, at any time as a, the message is just so obvious and clear as soon as you look at them. Um, um, I also wanted just to say that uh, I think the, uh, the way that Torbe's work has, has continued to, uh, has, has been used by, uh, or, or, or has, been, has served by Moomin characters and Rolle and Sophia uh, to... Um, to carry messages, and, and the most interesting one of these recently was um, with a, a campaign for Oxfam, uh, which um, Raleigh came up with the idea that the invisible child, um, the story of welcoming refugees, could be used um, in aid of refugees. And uh, the book was republished, uh, well, the book, the story was published as a standalone 
in, I think, four or five countries, and it became uh, then the focus of lots of activities for Oxfam, and they've now made three million pounds out uh, for refugee action. And um, uh, it's a kind of wonderful thing that Torbe's work uh, continues to have this, this, this very strong purpose and function. Um, and that, it, and that it grows from the stories that she created so naturally, I think. It's also like her characters, like, because the, the people in the live, the, the, pod, the, the live stream missed the, uh, the gender discussion in earlier right. on, is that uh, the characters age also very well according to our ideas of sexuality because uh, so both the themes and the art and her life and her vision, it's all very contemporary. And the, and the, and the characters, I remember, they're all on this kind of very fluid, uh, very many of them are, are kind of... The gender fluid moments. Yes. Yeah, and yeah they are. They, it's very they don't even have mouths. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it's... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's it's astonishing and it's also inspiring and you think actually how 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 can you be so relevant through so much change so much time and for your work to carry on uh, yeah yeah yes yeah, yeah. yeah i think we're out of time but just to bring it back to the movements uh the invisible child uh when um this was published uh, as a campaign for oxfam uh Sophia and Rolly went with Oxfam to uh, Rwanda to, to visit refugee camps and see what, what was being done with the money that had been raised uh, by the movement campaign. And uh, Oxfam had arranged to have the invisible child translated into one of the local Rwandan languages. And uh, this was read to, to, to children in a, uh, I think outside a school in Rwanda. So that, uh, Probably, I mean, the movements have been translated into so many languages, but I think that probably was the most, uh, uh, the, the smallest, most niche language uh, that they've ever been translated into, and such a beautiful way for, for it to have happened. I think we're out of time, but thank you very much for... Yes, <laughs>